Welcome to a new series of the West this week. Tonight, we target the drugs crisis that's bringing violent crime to many parts of the West. Now we're looking at a unique attempt being made this weekend to do something about the international drugs trade that's at the heart of the problem. First, though, tonight, the drugs trade, its effects, and where it all starts. There's increasing violence on West Country streets as a growing number of addicts turn criminal to feed their habit. Up to half the crimes in Bristol are thought to be committed by youngsters high on drugs, including the cocaine-based crack. Bath and Swindon have similar problems of drugs-related crime. It's causing growing concern to police and the communities who are its victims. Avon's probation service are so worried about it, they're now conducting their own survey. But this weekend, a conference in Bristol will be looking at the crisis from a different perspective. In a unique meeting, they'll contrast the problems of a region where some of the drugs come from alongside those of the West Country, where the same drugs could well end up. We have reports tonight on the devastating effects of the drugs trade and from one of the places where it all starts, the coca-growing cocaine bowl of South America. Military strength has always been a highly visible force in the war against drugs. The United States, the West's most addicted nation with two million known cocaine users, has led the armed offensive against the South American drug barons. The Pentagon has committed $420 million in military assistance to the Andean region for counter-narcotics operations. Here in the Andean foothills, a small insignificant shrub covers the landscape. The coca plant is the only source of income for thousands of impoverished Bolivian peasant farmers who use the leaves to make herbal tea. It's also the main ingredient in the manufacture of cocaine and its derivative crack, fashion drugs to the glitterati and key to a worldwide market worth $35 billion a year, much of it ending on the streets of Britain in cities like Bristol. In 1986, President Reagan declared the drugs trade was a threat to national security. Matty de Coca, the tea drunk by the Pope on a recent visit, is banned under the 1961 Vienna Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Such is the fear over the plant's more sinister use. The South American cocaine trade is driven by three forces. Demand for the drug in the Northern Hemisphere in countries like the United States and Europe. The traffickers who fuel demand by increasing the drug's availability and reducing its price and poverty in the Andean region, a powerful incentive for farmers to grow coca. If people were not using drugs, there would be no market for it. People would not supply it. People in the third world would not grow crops that are turned into drugs. So until drug use in the rich north, in the countries of the west, let's say, is addressed, and poverty in the third world is addressed, we believe the drug trade will continue. Coca is an indelible part of Andean culture. Chewing the leaves counters the effect of living at high altitude. According to one Bristol-based journalist, it can also ease the pain of childbirth. This is the way they're laid. I know that in Bolivia, a number of women use coca leaf in childbirth. They consider that natural to use that in childbirth. Well, rather than condemning these countries in South America and saying, oh, well, what are we going to do with this terrible cocaine problem? Maybe we could study how those societies use the leaf in order to learn something from them, rather than us just going in and saying, oh, just take, you know, say no to drugs. But it's the drug trafficking surrounding the coca plant which Western leaders are most anxious to root out at source. If that means denying Andean farmers their livelihood, they argue, then it's a price worth paying. The United Nations has begun a systematic campaign of destruction in the coca fields, designed to force these communities into growing other crops like coffee, even though most simply won't grow in such difficult terrain. The substitution programs have failed. We want a coca zone controlled by the government, where we can grow coca for legitimate use. We simply can't survive without the coca fields. In any case, cocaine isn't the only problem drug. What about alcohol or tobacco? How many more people die from drinking and cigarette smoking? Concerns echoed by the Princess Royal, who told an international ministerial drug summit in London three years ago the West had spent millions on law enforcement, but had failed to help the coca producers find legitimate markets for their crop. 
to stop producers is rather like asking the Scots to stop growing barley. Because people on the other side of the world can't hold their drink. Or the French from growing grapes. But behind the smiles, there was a serious point. Three years on, the international community still ignores the economic consequences of a blanket trade ban on coca. Instead, it concentrates efforts on the military manoeuvres against cocaine factories like this, a public relations exercise which fails to address the real problem. It's going to take a complete effort from everybody involved, not only from enforcement, but from education, from eradication, from uh, every country that's involved in the processing and cultivating and distributing and consuming the drugs. It's not a, it's not a war that's going to be won down here. The Bolivian government is desperate to have coca legalized, not least so it can realize a dream of seeing the nation's favorite beverage on supermarket shelves worldwide. If Mate de Coca captured just 5% of the global market for hot drinks, the cash-strapped country would have a bigger foreign earner than its existing main export natural gas, according to aid agencies diverting at least some of the coca destined for the illegal cocaine trade. Well, I was actually really shocked when I came to Bristol because I thought it was a nice provincial town. One of the first things I saw was, you know, people selling rocks in kind of doing their little deals in, in cars and stuff. If I wanted drugs now, I'd probably have them in 10 to 15 minutes. And I don't even come from here. I don't know any dealers here, but I could score in quarter of an hour probably. Charlie was 15 when he began experimenting with LSD and Valium tranquilizers. Within two years, he'd become a junkie, hooked on heroin and the highly addictive cocaine-based crack. Theft and fraud financed Charlie's habit, which soon cost him up to 500 pounds a day. Yeah, I mean, I've been standing in the streets with people with kind of bread knives up against one side of me at 8 o'clock in the morning trying to buy drugs, and that was like a normal morning for me. But crack is especially violent. Um, the reaction to the come down so horrific um, that you'll do anything to get more. And if that involves killing somebody, well, that's what, you know, the length people will go to. Bristol is one of Britain's leading distribution centres for crack cocaine. Although official figures suggest amphetamines and heroin are still the main sources of drug abuse in the West, it's crack which many see as the new drugs menace. And it's most visible in the St Paul's district of the city. The drug dealers of St Paul's ply their illicit trade in dingy cafes and here on the streets. Violence and intimidation are part of the drug's culture, where tiny foils of crack pass hands for between 25 and 30 pounds a time. But Bristol's drug traffic isn't restricted to St Paul's. Crack is as freely available, if more expensive, here, behind the well-heeled avenues of Clifton. It's not a class thing, it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing, it's not a poor, rich, whatever thing, it's a people thing. Um, they're available right from the sort of heady heights, if you want to call it, of Clifton, down to the obvious sort of media representation of drug life, which is St Paul's. It's not, nothing to do with that. It's everywhere. And it's increasing, especially among the young. Campaigners believe as many as one in five of all children have been offered drugs by the time they're 15. It's important that we wake up young people to what's actually happening around them before somebody else does. My youngest child is six years old and I'm waking him up to the facts of drugs. He knows what um, certain things he sees on the television. So we've got to wake up our children bright and early. Six years old? That's right. Drugs awareness is everybody's business. And I think America's waking up to yet. Yeah, um, everybody's got to get involved, from the teachers, the parents, um, your grandparents, your uncles, everybody's got to get involved. It's a view shared by police who've witnessed an alarming increase in drugs-related crime across Avon and Somerset. 52% of all crimes, including robberies, ram raiding, even fraud, can be traced back to drug use. It started off really with just doing checkbooks, buying goods in shops and selling them or swapping them for drugs. And then I actually became quite an artist at that sort of thing um, by actually using people's bank accounts, using numbers, you know, getting hold of people's checkbooks before they even knew it was stolen so that we could just, you know, have two or three days of, of having as much money as possible. 
Among the victims of drugs crime are local traders who've seen their stores repeatedly raided by teenage thieves. My members have reported that uh, usually these people are very young, energetic and even athletic, dressed up in very expensive designer clothes almost, with um, ex very expensive footwear trainers. And they're in and out like um, a flash of lightning. Bristol's drug problem shows every sign of escalating. Ports like Avonmouth are under increased surveillance to stem the flow of cocaine, heroin and other drugs being imported into Britain from South America. We have here very experienced search teams. We also have an international network of intelligence, all of which will be funneled into deciding how we're going to handle uh, such shipping. Clearly, it's of very great importance to the, the southwestern community that this commercial traffic comes here and we don't want to stand in its way. At the same time, we don't want to see cocaine being landed in the southwest. This weekend, the debate moves to Bristol, where an international conference will focus on what Europe is doing to stop the trafficking. Until efforts are made to address the real causes, not just the symptoms, and trafficking, I would say, is more of a symptom than a cause, then yes, the drugs trade will continue. And it's up to politicians and the public in the north and in the south to decide what they want. If they want it to continue, then carry on with the same policies. Until they are changed, trade in the humble coca plant will continue to be clouded by the misery of addiction. Well, joining us now in our London studio, Bolivian journalist Roger Cortez, who's just arrived in Britain to address Saturday's conference. And here in Bristol, Liam Fox, MP for Woodspring and a junior minister at the Home Office. Now, if I could turn first to, to Roger Cortez. Now, Roger, you're a, uh, a one-time politician. You are obviously well informed on the drug trade in Bolivia. First off, can you tell us what you think the West could do to help themselves and to help your government in your country or by helping your country? Well, I'm quite sure that it, what it's needed is a radical change of point of view. In the last 30 years, uh, the Western world, and especially the United States, have uh, uh, led a uh, so-called war on drugs, which major point of view is to fight the offer, the, the fight the, the producing side, and very little has been done about uh, the demand. And if you analyze historically what happened, you will see that, for instance, my country, Bolivia, have started to produce larger quantities of coca leaf in order to make uh, cocaine in, from the moment that the uh, world market, and especially United States market, uh, have grown in their demand. So one point that to begin with is to change the approach that was uh, putting all the emphasis in the producing side. Uh, and that means, at the same time, that you have to look, to have a, a wider look of the problem, because uh, it's not possible to ask uh, countries like Bolivia or Peru to lower the production of coca leaf as the meantime as other commodities, like in, for instance, uh, let's say, uh, the tin uh, is going down so badly because uh, these kind of economical problems have a direct impact in the economy of, of our countries, make rise and employment, and uh, create lower possibilities of income for the people. Let, let so me just stop you there, Roger. Liam, if I could turn to you on that point particularly, do you hear anything uh, from Mr. Cortes that you, you have sympathy with, or do you think it's an area we really ought to look at? Well, we have been arguing for some time that many of the third world countries are actually adversely affected by protectionist measures taken by the West and by Europe, and that's one of the reasons why it's extremely important that we get, for example, the GATT agreement, uh, because these countries which are being discriminated against now would benefit most from a liberalization of trade and uh, at the present time it's not really good enough for us in the the northern hemisphere to, to lecture them purely about production when we discriminate against some of the other goods which they export and that's something that the government attaches immense importance to. Roger, uh, can you be specific? What specific things could uh, say the British government do to, to help to help us with our problem here? The first thing uh, I could see it's that it's necessary that European countries and let's say the United Kingdom begins to uh, create their own their own point of view 
because until now, in many, many European countries, what have made most is to follow the directions and, and, uh, and American policy. Uh, and this is not uh, good at all because uh, the problems of each country are quite different. For instance, one thing, uh, this uh, political approachment of the United States have put a terrible emphasis on cocaine trade and have forgotten uh, other drugs like, uh, let's say, heroin. And heroin it's the, uh, is the l larger problem down in e Europe. And so uh, this kind of uh, blind f following of uh, the uh, United American States policy, policy yeah. it's uh, causing that uh, the things are not well uh, comprehended and uh, it's causing not to have a, a better approach to the problem. If I can put again back to Liam Fox, Liam Fox, do, do you feel that there is an opportunity here for a meeting of the minds and that actually people like Roger's government and our government should get together more and, and treat this as a common problem and as you say, not to lecture them, but perhaps to look for ways that we could work together? Well, in the United Kingdom, this isn't looked at purely as an enforcement problem. The Home Office takes the direct uh, control over the whole issue, but it uh, involves the Department of Health and the Department for Education because I think that we accept that you cannot inverted commas, wage a war on drugs on one front only. You have to deal with the uh, supply, that's for sure, and, and I mentioned another way we could help third world countries, but you have to have enforcement as well, you have to have education, you have to have rehabilitation programs, and in the United Kingdom we've now introduced um, education on drug and substance abuse into our national curriculum for the first time. Finally then, because we've, we've almost run out of time, uh, Roger, if there was one thing that could be done to help people in Bolivia, uh, and thus help us, as I keep saying, what would that be, briefly now? Quite briefly, I'd say that, um, uh, referring what uh, uh, it just was say a few minutes ago, you, if you think that liberalization of the market uh, would help here and uh, third world countries, it would be good to liberalize, we say, the coca leaves uh, uh, trade, because uh, coca leaves are quite different from cocaine. Coca is not cocaine and that would give, give uh, to many farmers the choice of a legal kind of uh, trade. Uh, we think in Bolivia that coca is as uh, safe and as good, let's say, as tea. So that would be a very good initiative uh, and to be loyal with uh, the proposals and, and policies of free market, for instance. Roger, thank you very much. And just in a word, Liam Fox, do you think that's ever going to be a starter? Yes or no? I think we will not ever legalize anything that's currently criminalized, but I think that we must aim at education for our young people to reduce the, the demand for drugs in the United Kingdom. That has to be our top priority. Liam Fox, Roger Cortez in London, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And Roger Cortez uh, hopefully recovered from that long flight.